Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian true crime cases and today we are covering the case of Luke Batty. So having said that, let's get straight into today's case. In 2014, Luke Batty was an 11 year old schoolboy from Victoria in Australia who loved sports, particularly football and cricket. His mother described him as effervescent. He was funny. He wasn't the best scholar, but he was intelligent. He enjoyed his school. His mother, Rosie Batty, and father, Greg Anderson, were not together at this time and had not been for quite a long time. Rosie Batty and Greg Anderson met back in 1992 where they worked together at a recruitment company. Their relationship lasted for two years and in this time, Greg did show signs of violence towards Rosie Batty. After two years, the pair went their separate ways and just moved on with their lives, entered into new relationships and didn't really think about each other for a little while at least. Eight years later, Rosie Batty and Greg Anderson resumed contact. From what I could find, it was Greg who made this initial contact, but I couldn't find any reliable source that did confirm this. And the relationship they resumed was, from what I understood, a purely physical one. It also resulted in Rosie falling pregnant for the first time. Rosie, who was in her late 30s at the time, was a high-risk pregnancy, and she did admit that the pregnancy was an accident. She didn't picture herself being with Greg Anderson long term and in fact she hadn't even really pictured herself being a mother. Rosie herself grew up in the UK where she lost her mother at a very young age and this loss very early in life led Rosie to develop a fear of losing those she loved. Regardless, Rosie Batty decided to go through with her pregnancy. Rosie and Greg's son, Luke Batty, was born on June the 20th, 2002, and Greg Anderson was not present at his son's birth. Instead, he was at a Russian Orthodox monastery in New South Wales, and I couldn't find any explanation as to why he was there instead of at his son's birth. But from what I could find, it did appear that Rosie had some friends with her at her son's birth, so at least she wasn't alone at this, what should be a very joyous time. Greg eventually did return to take part in his newborn son's life. And at first, he was actually a very involved father, despite not being present for Luke's birth. Not long after Luke's birth, Greg assaulted Rosie for the first time, forcing Rosie to get into a physical altercation with him, which she described as having to wrestle him. And at this time, she still had her cesarean stitches in, which I can't imagine getting in a physical altercation, having stitches anywhere in my body, let alone my stomach. So I can't imagine how painful and uncomfortable that would have been for her. Not surprisingly, this incident did bring an end to their relationship. The pair did remain in contact for the sake of their son, but unfortunately Luke was witness to some altercations between his parents from a very young age. Around the time Luke was just two years old, he witnessed his father assault his mother for the first time. Greg told Rosie as he left her home that day, if you ever stop me seeing my son, I'll kill you and your animals. The next day, Rosie obtained an intervention order naming herself as the protected person. And I do believe an intervention order is basically a restraining order against somebody. This intervention order meant that Greg could only approach Rosie and her home if Rosie gave him permission to do so. Rosie would later describe obtaining this intervention order as a huge, huge fearful step as Rosie really did not know how Greg would react to this news as taking out this intervention order was the first step Rosie had really put in place or the first roadblock she had put in place to protect herself 
and her son. I imagine it would have been a shock to the system for Greg Anderson. Greg Anderson, however, had never been violent at all towards his son, Luke. In fact, they had a really great father and son relationship. Their love for each other was evident and Luke loved his father very much. And Greg seemed really keen to be part of Luke's life. Therefore, Rosie is still allowed Greg to have contact with Luke despite his abuse towards her. Rosie did the best that she could to encourage their father and son relationship to really blossom and flourish. Rosie did try to instill in Luke, however, that although Luke loved his father and his father loved him, Luke may not always like the things his father did. Throughout Luke's younger years, Greg had the tendency to disappear for periods of time, often going back to the Russian Orthodox Church in which he stayed at when Luke was born. Those who spent time at the monastery with Greg noticed an increasingly strange behaviour and a worrying behaviour in Greg. At times, Greg would state that he was seeing something that no one else was seeing. So he was basically imagining things being there. During one of these times away, Greg sent Luke an email. And at this time, Luke was only three years old. So it wasn't him going to receive the email or read it. It was going to be his mother, Rosie. The email stated, I'm disappointed in you, Luke. You have become too feminine. Your spirit, Luke, has a dark hood on your head and evil has its glue in your mother's life. I don't know what that email means. I don't think Rosie understood what that email meant, but it gave a little bit of an insight into maybe what was going on in Greg's head at that time. There eventually came a time period in Luke and Rosie's life, where it seemed that Greg Anderson had finally began to accept that he would not have any part in Rosie's life. He would play a role in Luke's life, but would have nothing to do with Rosie. And during this time period, the intervention order actually expired and Rosie didn't bother to renew it. And just to clarify, she didn't bother to renew it because Greg had not been causing any trouble, so she didn't see any need to. And also during this time, Rosie actually entered into a, a romantic relationship. I couldn't find out exactly how long this relationship had lasted. I think it must have lasted a few years because by the time they broke up, Luke was nine years old. And in this time, Luke had really grown up to be a beautiful, quirky young boy who Rosie described as a very easy child and Rosie was just really happy with how things were going in her and her son's life. Especially the fact that it appeared that Greg was getting on with his own life as well. However, when Rosie did become single again when Luke was nine, she did struggle quite a bit with juggling all the responsibilities she had in her life, which included Luke, her animals, her work, things like that. She had help initially from her partner and then it was gone. At this point, Greg stepped back in to help Rosie sort out her life. And at this point, it really had been a few years since Rosie and Greg had been around each other. So Rosie really began to forget the incidents of the past, or at least, Put them to the back of her mind because as I said, she was feeling incredibly overwhelmed at this point in her life. A relationship just ended and she needed that help really badly. And it was kind of ironic that Greg was trying to help Rosie sort out her life when his life at this point was honestly the shambles. He had no home. He was basically homeless. He had no job. Rosie would later describe him as basically unemployable and Greg was living out of his car and the final straw came for Greg when his car which was his home and his transport broke down. Initially Rosie did offer Greg a place to stay while he got his feet 
back on the ground and got his car fixed but his response was not good. The old Greg, so to say, came out and he really lost his temper, which caused Rosie to immediately retract her offer of a place to stay. Greg, who was enraged that Rosie had taken back her offer, broke into Rosie and Luke's house that night and ended up chasing Rosie around her own house. Luckily, Rosie did manage to grab the phone and call the police. But before police could get there, Greg caught up with Rosie, dragged her behind the couch and assaulted her. Unfortunately, Luke Batty was witness to this whole event unfold. The police did eventually show up and Greg Anderson was arrested and charged. On the police statement regarding the incident, it had stated that Greg Anderson suffered from a mental paranoia disorder. Police at this time also applied for a new intervention order for Rosie Batty, but naming both Rosie and Luke as persons of protection under this intervention order, as opposed to the first one where it was just Rosie named under protection. I don't know if Rosie applied for this or police applied on her behalf. It would make sense as her former partner did come into her house uninvited and assaulted her. It seems like putting a prevention order in place would have been the next step for police, logically. And Rosie had really hoped at this point that Greg would go out and seek treatment or he would receive the treatment that he desperately needed. However, Greg did not seek out nor receive any treatment for his mental health or his anger issues. Greg did actually tell the people at the monastery he attended that he was a diagnosed and medicated schizophrenic, but Rosie was not aware of any such diagnosis and nor is there any record anywhere to really back this up either. At this time as well, Greg Anderson was also frequently attending a Hare Krishna temple but was eventually banned from the temple for attacking an 80 year old man over a very minor incident. I believe the 80 year old man had complained to Greg over just some litter that had come onto his property on or near the temple and Greg had physically assaulted him. And this was just another incident that was stacking up against Greg to demonstrate the level of anger and violence that he was getting to, I guess. But Greg was still allowed to contact his son, Luke, during these more trying times, should we call them, because he really had never shown any signs of violence or anger or anything towards his own son. Moving forward to 2013 and Greg Anderson was at it again with Rosie. He was standing at her front gate shouting that he was going to kill her. I have no idea what brought about this outburst from Greg but Rosie did phone the police as this was of course completely inappropriate but also a breach of the intervention order in place. The police told Rosie they would come and arrest Greg the next day when he came to pick up Luke. I think they were choosing to arrest him the next day because they didn't actually know where Greg lived as he was technically homeless for a good chunk of time, which I believe included this period of time. But what I don't understand is how Greg had permission basically to be collecting his son the next day. I thought Luke was protected under the intervention order. I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding information in this case or if Rosie had given permission for Greg to be a part of Luke's life because Greg had not shown any signs of violence towards his son. I, I'm guessing that is the case, that Rosie had allowed it and so Greg was still having frequent contact with Luke, but then why put his name on the intervention order? Again, kindly correct me down below if you have anything to add to this portion. So the next day, Greg was arrested in Rosie's driveway 
and he was charged by police but subsequently he just walked free. And even after this incident, Greg was still allowed contact by law with Luke. In that same year, 2013, one day when Luke and his father Greg were alone together in Greg's car, Greg turns to Luke and threatens him with a knife. He doesn't touch Luke, but he simply says to him, it could all end with this. He proceeded to tell Luke how sick he was of this life and how he just wished that he could go on to the next one. And he gave the impression that he wanted to do this with Luke. Of course, Luke told his mother what had taken place. And Rosie, who always felt that Luke was safe with Greg and had always defended his right to see his son, felt utterly sick and disturbed at what had taken place and felt that she could never trust Greg again with, his, with her son alone. And of course, Rosie at this point, unsurprisingly, decided that Greg would have no more contact with her son. And this was taken to court and the court decided the same thing, that Greg would have no further contact with his son, Luke Batty. What was also revealed in court at this time, however, was that Greg Anderson had child pornography charges to his name and Rosie Batty had had no idea. This was the first time she was finding this out and she was overcome with fear that Greg had potentially been grooming Luke during their time together. It didn't appear that he had been, but of course I can't imagine finding this out in court and just having no idea when you had believed your son was safe with his father. And it was due to privacy laws as to why Rosie Batty had never been informed of this heinous crime that her ex-partner was being charged with that, and, and like the police knew that Luke Batty was often in the, the by himself, um, I'm just so frustrated at this, um, losing my wording, but basically police couldn't tell Rosie about the child pornography charges because of privacy laws, which I understand, but when you as police know a child is under the care of that person with child pornography charges, surely you would say something to the mother. Surely there is some exception or loophole or something. I just don't understand. In July of 2013, Greg Anderson challenged the intervention order that had been put in place for him not to be able to see his son. And as a result, he was given access to Luke in public places only. So for example, when Luke was playing sports. And Rosie did agree to this, believing it was a good enough or a decent compromise considering not long after this, the Victorian Child Protection System closed Luke's case. By December of 2013, it appeared that Rosie and Luke's life was slowly returning to normal and things were going pretty good. Luke was doing well in school and the two of them, Luke and Rosie, were about to head off to the UK to visit Rosie's family. And they were going there over Christmas, which I imagine, well for me at least, as an Australian, going to have your first white Christmas would be very exciting. So I imagine this to be a very exciting time, especially for Luke going on a holiday, going to have a white snowy Christmas. It just would have been a great time in both their lives. During their time in the UK, Greg Anderson failed to make both his court and his bail appearances and warrants were issued for his arrest. Again, Rosie had no idea what was going on with Greg and was not informed that he had failed to turn up to bail and court appearances. Also during this time, Greg had a, another intervention order placed against him. This time it was by a roommate who Greg had not only threatened to kill, but he threatened to cut the roommate's head off. And not surprisingly, this roommate put an intervention order against Greg Anderson. Again, though, Rosie Batty was told none of this. So as Greg became more aggressive and more violent and escalated, and not to mention the fact 
He had multiple warrants out for his arrest. The police didn't feel it necessary to tell Rosie that this was happening with someone that had access to her son. Like that just blows my mind. It doesn't make sense. On February the 5th, 2014, so at this point, both Rosie and Luke had returned from the UK. A police officer rang Rosie asking if she knew where Greg Anderson was staying at this time, like what was his current address. And Rosie did not know, but very coincidentally, Greg Anderson actually called Rosie that same day to let her know what his new address was, as he had just moved. And I assume he probably just moved out of the roommate's house he had threatened to kill. But anyway, Rosie did call the police back to let them know where Greg Anderson was staying. Again, during this police interaction, Rosie Batty was not informed of anything that was going on with Greg Anderson. And maybe if she had been informed, she would have made some very different decisions regarding what happens next. On February the 12th, 2014, which was a Wednesday evening, and not very long at all after Rosie had been contacted by police as to Greg's whereabouts, Greg actually showed up at a cricket practice that Rosie had been at with Luke. The cricket practice was at an oval, so like a public oval, so Technically, Greg could be there because it was a public area. He was allowed to see his son in a public place. There was other people there. He was, he was fine to be there. And Greg did seem to be in good spirits that day. And not to mention the fact Luke had not seen his father since before the UK. Greg and Luke went together to practice playing some cricket in one of the cricket nets initially playing with one of Luke's friends and then just practicing by themselves. Later in the evening and as things were beginning to wind up, Luke asked his mother for just a few more minutes playing with his father as he hadn't seen him in quite a while. And his mother agreed, not seeing the harm in just a couple of more minutes, even though the evening was really winding down. And at this point, most of the other kids and their parents had left the Oval, but there was a few people still scattered around. Shortly after Rosie had agreed to this, she heard a disturbing sound, as she put it. It appeared as though Luke had had some kind of accident. At least that's what it looked like when she saw Greg leaning over her son, Luke. It turned out that an eight-year-old boy had actually witnessed the whole incident. The young boy ran to his father, who was one of the cricket coaches, and was shouting at him with such intensity and hysteria that his father could not make out what he was saying. All he could gather was that his son was saying something about a cricket bat and a boy in a yellow shirt. Rosie immediately went to call an ambulance, although thinking it could have been an overreaction, she did go to do it anyway, but was so incredibly stressed over the situation that she was struggling to do so. Rosie instead ran towards a group of people still at the Oval, shouting at them, call an ambulance, this is really bad. As Rosie got closer to Greg and Luke, it appeared that there had been an accident and that Greg had accidentally injured Luke while they were practicing, possibly a knock to the head with a cricket bat. And this really made sense at the time because Greg's reaction was complete anguish over his son's condition. Greg was comforting his son inside the cricket net as they waited for an ambulance. And at this point, no one else was inside the cricket net. When the cricket coach actually went over to the cricket net, to check on Luke and Greg and ask how Luke was doing, Greg responded to him by saying, yes, he's fine. He's in heaven now. By this point, Rosie, who believed the accident must have been really serious, was screaming and inconsolable. Paramedics eventually arrived to treat Luke's injuries, but they were unable to revive him and he did pass away in the cricket net that evening.
by his father Greg's side. Before paramedics could actually work on Luke that evening, however, they were forced to call police when Greg Anderson threatened the paramedics with a knife. Witnesses, including young children, would go on to tell police what they had witnessed that evening. Greg Anderson was seen intentionally hitting his son, Luke, over the head with a cricket bat repeatedly before getting a knife out and stabbing him to death. Greg Anderson then proceeded to stab himself. When police arrived on the scene, Anderson resisted arrest and this forced police officers to shoot him. Greg Anderson passed away at 1.30 a.m. that morning. During the commotion, Rosie Batty had been repeatedly asking to see her son, Luke but she was refused. She was told by a police officer that she would not want to see her son like that. And at this time, Rosie Batty did not know what was going on. At the time of Greg Anderson's death, there were four warrants out for his arrest, but due to his homelessness, he was very difficult to track down. Greg had been living in a boarding house at the time of his death. And Greg also had the two intervention orders against him at this time. The next morning, Rosie Batty went into the police station to give a three hour long statement to police. And this was after, hours after, losing her own son and her ex-partner. And realistically, she might have still been coming to terms with, well, she definitely was coming to terms with what had happened, but coming to terms with the truth about what had happened and what her ex-partner had done. Rosie also made a statement to the media outside her home the next day. She stated, I want to tell everybody that family violence happens to everyone, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are, it happens to anyone and everyone. And this has been an 11 year battle but you do the best you can and you're a victim and you're helpless. An intervention order doesn't stop anything like this happening. A candlelit vigil was attended by hundreds on the cricket oval where Luke Batty passed away. Rosie Batty puts Anderson's mental health down to the main reason why he did what he did to his beloved son. Anderson did not receive any treatment for his mental health issues or his anger issues at any point in his life to the best of anyone's knowledge. Rosie stated that Luke was the only bright light in his life. And Rosie really had believed at the time that Luke was safe with his father in an open environment like the Oval, a cricket Oval, surrounded by other families. She was unaware of the trouble that Greg Anderson had been in in the months leading up to his death and to Luke's death. Had she been informed, Rosie probably would have made some very different decisions that day on the cricket Oval. And she herself says this is true, that if she had been informed, she would not have let Greg be anywhere near her son in a public area or not. Greg, however, did wait until most of the families had left the cricket oval that evening and took his chance to isolate Luke within a cricket net. And this really does point to a premeditated crime that and the fact he had a knife, of course. Police, child protection, and of course, Rosie herself never ever believed that Greg Anderson, despite his history, would lay a finger on Luke Batty, his son. He spent years physically and mentally abusing Rosie, but had never touched Luke until the day he died. She stated that no one loved Luke more than Greg, his father. No one loved Luke more than me. We both loved him. Rosie believes that Luke's death was the final and the ultimate act of vengeance after Greg lost control over Rosie. Rosie Batty went on to start the Luke Batty Foundation, a foundation that she started as a tribute to her son and so that her son's death and her own tragic experience would not be in vain. 
it gave Rosie a new purpose in life and it really brought family violence to the forefront of people's minds within Australia and across the world where her, her story has touched so, so many. In 2015, Rosie Batty was named Australian of the Year and the following year, she was named number 33 in the list of the world's greatest leaders in Fortune magazine. In 2015 and in 2016, Rosie Batty was named one of the most influential people at the Impact 25 Awards. She stated, Luke, my little man, you did not die in vain and will not be forgotten. You are beside me on this journey and with me every step of the way. On June the 3rd, 2018, the Luke Batty Foundation announced on its website, some months ago, Rosie announced she would be stepping back from the Luke Batty Foundation. Tomorrow, we are formally closing our doors and distributing the funds Rosie and her supporters worked so hard to raise in support of the victims of family violence. And I will leave a link down below to the full statement and to the Luke Batty Foundation website if you are interested. Having said that, thank you so, so much for listening to Luke's story and listening to Rosie's story as well. I want to end this by as well thanking my incredible patrons. Each and every one of you are an absolute star. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon.